So this week, um, every week our team gets together and, and we spend some time praying, we spend some time planning, um, praying for you. We go through our, our, our church family and pray for our church family. And we, we grabbed our, our prayer list and we were praying, we put out a prayer list every week. By the way, if you don't get one, they're always at the back table back there and I would encourage you to get one. It has one of our missionary letters on the back and it has prayer requests that are submitted during the course of the week and we try to update this every week. This is, this is public, so let me just read the first 20 or so requests on this list. Alejandra is asking for healing, Althea, breast cancer, Amber, complete healing, Amber healing from breast cancer. This is a 36-year-old mother with three kids. Barney healing from lung cancer. Bob healing in the eye. Bob healing from leukemia. Brian healing from leukemia. Carolyn healing from bone cancer. Carolyn healing from brain cancer. Charlene healing from pulmonary fibrosis. David, upcoming radiation. Dean needs a miracle. Debbie, healing from cancer. Dennis, healing from pulmonary fibrosis. Diva, healing from cancer. Eddie, healing. Elaine, healing from Parkinson's. Elias, healing from seizures. Elijah, heart transplant. Evelyn, healing from cancer. I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop there. And we realized, man, we have a lot of people in our congregation that are hurting. We have a lot of people in our church that are, that are suffering. Matter of fact, 96 names on our prayer list, 80 of the 96 names are asking for some type of healing for cancer. Almost half of them are going through cancer and other struggles that they're going through. And then like you, we hear of all the tragedies that are taking place around the world, and I don't have to enumerate them again. We've heard of the tragedies that have taken place in, in Las Vegas and the shootings around the country, and then the people who were affected by the hurricanes in Houston and the Keys and Puerto Rico. And we realized, man, there are a lot of people that are hurting. We heard recently of a 20-year-old in our community who's tragically killed in an automobile accident. The pastor of Coral Ridge, Rob Paciencia, a good friend of mine, two weeks ago, lost his three-year-old daughter. They placed her in bed that night, and later on that night went to check on her, and she was unresponsive. By the time they got to the hospital, that little three-year-old was gone. Even in our leadership team, we've noticed Pastor Jose is going through all kinds of struggles. He's had two eye surgeries in the last couple of months. Brad has, ha, has openly shared with you the infertility struggles that he and Kelly are going through. Mark Medcalf just had mouth surgery and is struggling with that. Stephen, you'd never know it. Stephen struggles with Crohn's disease and different things. Ron Milner, one of our elders, was just diagnosed with Parkinson's, and this week his mother-in-law went home to be with the Lord. Wilson told me today that in the last year, he's lost almost, or I think it was six of his family members. And then, man, the Burkholders were mourning the loss that Ohio State had last night. We just, that's just, it's, I don't appreciate Mike bringing that up publicly, but it's real and it's palpable for us. I'm joking. Jesus, Jesus described the troubles that we're going to go through, that we're going through in a very simple way. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, he makes this simple yet incredibly profound statement. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. Simple. And yet it describes all of our lives. The New Living Translation says it this way, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. I read through that verse last night and, and I was meditating on it and the thought that I wrote down with this was this, wow, what a bleak forecast. In the world you will have many trials. In the midst of so much suffering, many people are crying out today, is there hope? In the midst of suffering, in the midst of tragedy, 
in the midst of loss of life, in the midst of pain, in the midst of financial struggles, is there hope? Let me just pause at the very beginning and, and say with a resounding statement, yes, there is hope in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you are going through today. There is hope in Jesus Christ. Last night, we were uh, with five other churches at, at Young Circle, and we had an event called Hope for Hollywood. It was an exciting event as there was worship, and like six of us pastors got up and, and talked, but the idea that we were able to convey there in the very center of downtown Hollywood is this, in Jesus Christ, there is hope. doesn't matter what you're going through today. You might be going through a situation that seems hopeless. You might be in a hole that you have no idea how you are going to dig out of. You might be in a relationship that seems dark and gloomy and depressing. But be assured of the fact that in Jesus Christ, you have hope. As a follower of Jesus Christ, your suffering does not have to extinguish your spirit. And your present suffering will not affect your future glory. And we see that in the passage that we're going to be studying. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to walk through a small book in the New Testament, but a book that is very practical, very applicable to your life and mine, and it's the book of 1 Peter. So would you take your Bibles with me and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1? We're going to spend some time because the, the people to whom Peter writes this epistle were going through trials and tribulations, maybe not the exact same thing that you and I are going through, but they were deep, they were dark, they were heavy, and they were hard. And Peter writes to them that in the midst of all of that, they have hope in Jesus Christ. Would you follow along? I'll put it up on the screen. I'll read the first nine verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. Let me just pause there and notice that, that all three persons of the Trinity are involved in our salvation. We, we were called by God the Father. We are brought to Jesus. We are sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit. And we are sealed, we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I love the last phrase of verse two. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. As I meditated on that phrase this week, I, I, I realized the truth that, that, that just sunk into me. It's this. You can never exhaust the grace and peace of God. Doesn't matter how many times you've asked for grace. Doesn't matter how many times you've asked for peace. Doesn't matter how many times you've called out and said, God, man, my heart is, is in turmoil. Give me peace. You can never exhaust it. Peter said, may God's grace, may God's peace be multiplied in your life. So each and every day, you can go to God afresh and anew and say, God, give me grace. Every day, you can go and say, God, give me peace because it's inexhaustible. May his grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the very salvation 
of your souls. Would you pray with me today? Oh God, today we bow before you. We bow before you as our redeemer. We bow before you as our omnipotent father. We bow before you as a caring God who's not oblivious to the suffering that we are going through. A God who cares for us more than we could ever imagine. So Lord, as we examine our own suffering in the light of your word, I pray that you do a couple of things today. I pray that you would encourage us. I pray for those who are beaten down today. I pray for those who are without hope today. I pray that they would find encouragement in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we would realize that we have hope in you. And I do pray for those that are here that, that don't know you personally, like Peter talks about. I pray that today, in a very real and palpable way, you would introduce yourself to them. I pray that they would realize that, that they can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because of that which he has done for us. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so you notice today that we have ended abruptly, but we've ended our series on the book of Exodus. The truth, though, and as we prayed about it this week, the truth, though, is that the message of First Peter is a continuation of the message of the book of Exodus. Here's what I mean. For, for eight or nine months, we've studied the fact that God's people were in bondage and they were in desperate need of a redeemer. They were in desperate need for God to come and rescue them out of the land of Egypt and take them to the promised land. Well, you're going to find here in 1 uh, Peter that God's people are on the run. And guess what they need? They need a redeemer. They need someone to come and rescue them, someone to come and save them. Here's what I want you to catch, and, and, and it's, it's really important as we go through this series. Suffering is a, has a purpose, and we'll talk about it. It's in the passage. Suffering has a purpose. Suffering is intended to help us see our need of a redeemer in our lives. Because we have a tendency to be self-sufficient. We have a tendency to think that we can make it on our own. And God graciously reminds us through trials and tribulations that we can't make it on our own, that we desperately need him. That's the book, or that's the theme of 1 Peter. The theme of 1 Peter is none other than Jesus Christ. I don't want to get ahead of myself. If you have your outline in front of you, I, uh, I wrote down just a couple of really simple points from the passage today. The first point that I want us to see is this, everyone suffers. As a matter of fact, take a second and look around the auditorium. Everyone here is either suffering, has suffered, or will suffer. There's not a single one of us here that are exempt from suffering. Suffering is not limited to a select few. It's not just the godly who suffer, even though sometimes we try to bear that weight upon ourselves. It's not just the ungodly that suffer either, because the godly suffer as well. Suffering is not restricted to the humble, the poor, the weak, or the uneducated. Everyone suffers, regardless of your nationality, regardless of the size of your bank accounts, Regardless of your body size, regardless of who you cheer for on Saturday, all of us suffer. The truth is this, you can't and I can't inoculate ourselves from suffering. There's no vaccination for it. Wouldn't it be great if we could show up at Walmart or, or Walgreens and go to the pharmacy and say, I need a vaccination. What do you need a vaccination for? Suffering. Do you have one? I think my insurance will cover it, you know? Uh, I want to uh, vaccinate myself so that I never suffer again. No, there's no vaccination for it. 
Here, here in today's passage, Peter mentions two ways that believers suffered. Believers suffered during New Testament times in two ways that believers suffer today. If you're following along in your outline, I simply said this, as a Christian in exile, you will be misunderstood. There will be times that you will be rejected and maybe even persecuted. Let me pause for a second and lay the context of what's taking place here. First Peter was written sometime around A.D. 65. We're not exactly sure, but, but sometime right after, we believe, the city of Rome burned. If you know much about history, the city of Rome burned in July of A.D. 64. The, the Romans were totally devastated by, by, by the destruction of their glorious city. The, their, their culture was destroyed. Their, their lifestyle was destroyed. Many people, as a result, were homeless, and many people were helpless. The, this bitter resentment was so severe that Nero, the emperor, realized he had to do something to redirect the hostility so it wasn't directed towards him. So, so guess what Nero decided to do? He blamed the Christians. The, they were already hated because of their close affiliation with, with, with the Jews, but Nero quickly spread word that it was the Christians who set the fires. It, were, it, it was those followers of Jesus Christ that lit those fires that burned down our city. History records that as a result, vicious persecution against the Christians began and soon spread throughout the Roman Empire. You say, Brian, like, like what were they going through? You can read history. Nero took Christians and he sewed them into the skins of animals and then sicked wild dogs on them. So those wild animals would tear those Christians to pieces. Nero had walkways around his palace, and he loved to walk around the walkways at night, but it was dark. So guess what Nero did? He impaled Christians on stakes, soaked them in wax, and lit them on fire. And they were the torches, Christians were the torches that lit the pathways of Nero. As you can imagine, the result of that was that Christians fled for their lives. The, the, this, this scattering as a result of persecution was, was called the dispersion, which is mentioned here, or the diaspora. You'll notice in verse 1, he says, to the elect exiles of the dispersion, to followers of Jesus Christ who had fled for their lives because of the persecution. And many of them fled to the areas that are mentioned here, Pontus and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, the area that's now known as Turkey today. Peter writes this letter to, to those Christians. Notice the term that he uses in verse 1. In verse 1, he simply says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. The, the word exiles means someone who is driven from their home, forced to live in a foreign land. Matter of fact, if you go to chapter 2 and verse 11, Peter uses that same word. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, as aliens in a foreign land. Aliens and exiles in a foreign land. Now, 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 I know what you're thinking, all right, because I worked through it this week too. You might sit back and say, Wait a second, Brian. I'm not an exile. <laughs> I. I live here in the United States. We might have even left other countries to come here to the United States. We live in the home of the free, the home of the brave. We have freedom. Listen to me for just a second, church. Like the Roman Empire, our country is becoming less and less Christian. Not going to elaborate on that today. But our country is becoming less and less Christian. Do not be surprised. Do not be surprised that because of the fact that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're not ashamed of it, that you will be misunderstood. 
Do not be surprised that because of the fact that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you will be rejected. Do not be surprised of the fact that because you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you maybe even will be persecuted, but be reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul said, our citizenship is not here, our citizenship is in heaven. And so in a very real sense, we are exiles. All right, we live today in a free country, but we are exiles, we are foreigners, we are sojourners that is looking, who are looking for a home that is beyond this place. So as a Christian in exile, we could experience rejection, misinterpretation, and persecution. There's a second thing that I wrote that we see in the passage. As a Christian on earth, you will experience physical suffering. As a Christian on earth, you will experience physical suffering. If you can can look in verse 6, I think I'll put it up on the screen. Peter says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. What a simple way to say. Listen, some of you are burned at the stake, but you've been grieved by various trials. Some of you have been placed in animal skins and you were tore apart. You've been grieved by various trials. Listen, here on earth, we will experience physical suffering. As you read through Scripture, you are reminded that even God's most faithful followers had physical struggles. Joseph, you know the stories, or you might. Joseph in the Old Testament was mistreated by his brothers He was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused, and he spent years in prison. Job, most upright man, the Bible says, in all the earth, and yet Job lost all of his possessions and lost all of his kids. Jeremiah, what a great prophet. Jeremiah spent months, if not years, in prison, sunk down into the mud of a dungeon and stayed there for months on end. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He asked God three times to remove it, and for some reason God chose not to. John was arrested and exiled to the island of Patmos. And even the author of this book, Peter and and the beloved apostle Paul, both of them were martyred. They lost their lives. Here's what I'm saying this morning that I want you to catch. Everyone suffers. You might be sitting back today saying, man, poor me, or pobrecito de mi, like we say in Spanish, poor me. Man, I'm the only one that's suffering. You're not. Everyone suffers. You know as well as I do that every day brings a new tragedy. A small child is diagnosed with leukemia, undergoes extensive medical treatment, only to die in his or her mother's arms. A newlywed couple is killed by a drunk driver as they leave for their honeymoon. A faithful missionary family is attacked and killed by the very people that they are ministering to. Thousands are killed in a terrorist attack. Hundreds drown in a tsunami while scores of others are buried alive in an earthquake. You and I read those things and we hear them on the news and we sit back and say, how, are, how is all of that possible? Either, and philosophers have come to two erroneous conclusions. They say either God is evil and he doesn't care or God is weak. He's not omnipotent and he cannot control things like he says he can. Well, you and I know that that is not the answer. Why do all of these terrible things happen? Listen, catch this. The sad things that happened around us, the sad things that happened to us, the sad things that happened in our lives are reminders of the fact that sin has consequences. (laughs) Here's what it reminds us of, that the world in which we live desperately needs a Savior. Everyone suffers. Peter says something else in the passage that will encourage you. The first is a little bleak, but the second will encourage you. Yes, everyone suffers, but your suffering is temporary. Catch this, no matter what you're going through today, 
Your suffering is temporary. There, there are three fantastic truths in these verses that we read that demonstrate that our suffering is only temporary and that we have hope in Jesus Christ. Now, notice verse 3. We read it just a few moments ago. I'll put it back up on the screen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, now remember, remember, he's not writing this to Jews who are sitting on the shores of the Mediterranean in the Hilton sipping pina coladas. That's not who he's writing this to. He's writing this to believers who are on the run. He's writing this to people who have lost their jobs, to people who have lost their families, they've lost their hope, they're suffering, they don't have anywhere to sleep at night, and they don't know what they're going to eat the next day. And Peter writes them, and here's what he says, you have a living hope because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The word living in the passage not only has the idea of being alive, but of being lively, of being active, of being at work in your life. Here's what I want you to catch. Because, the, because Jesus paid the price for your sins and mine, dying in your place, and then overcoming death by rising again, his victory is your victory. Sometimes we sit back and view Easter as, oh, that's the victory of Jesus Christ. It's not. It's your victory. It's my victory. We are alive today because of Jesus. We have hope today because of Jesus. Listen, listen. I know I'm, uh, I'm preaching to the choir today. You catch this, but, but understand, sin has no rule over you because of Jesus Christ. Sickness does not have to control you because of Jesus Christ. Death does not have dominion over you because of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that you're not going to get sick because you might get sick. I'm certainly not saying that you're not going to die because all of us are going to die. But listen, our focus, the intention of our life does not have to be on those things. Jesus said, man, Lift up your eyes. Look beyond your present circumstances. Understand that your suffering, yes, it's painful, but your suffering is only temporary. Catch this, church. As a believer, you can focus on one or two things. You can either focus on what is infecting you, or you can focus on who is indwelling you. Think about that. You can either focus on what is infecting you, which we do lots of times. We go through struggles and, 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 um, you, you know, transparency. Vicky knows that I'm the worst of this. All right, I have a pain in my leg. I'm on Google right away, and I walk in and say, Vicky, you know what? I think I got cancer in my leg. I think that's what it is, all right? And then I'll wake up with a little bit of crick in my neck, and I'll do a little bit of Google search, and Vicky, you know what? I think I got a tumor in the back of my neck. I think I do, all right? Am I exaggerating? No, I'm not exaggerating, all right? So, so, so here's what we do. I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? Uh, here's what we do. We focus, <laughs> we focus on what's infecting us instead of focusing on who is indwelling us. <laughs> what sickness when Jesus Christ resides in me. Man, I have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in me. So Paul says it this way in Colossians chapter 3. Man, set your mind on things above, not on things here on the earth. Listen, we have a living hope because of Jesus Christ. Let me show you a second thing in the passage. Because of Jesus, you have a guaranteed inheritance. Verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. Here's what I wrote in my notes. It's right there. Whoa! Did you catch that? Remember, he's not writing to people who had a whole bunch of stuff. He's writing to people who at this moment had nothing. They had lost everything. And he says, here's what I want you to get. (laughs) 
Don't lose this. You have an inheritance in heaven. Not just any inheritance, but you have an inheritance that is imperishable. It's undefiled. It is unfading, kept in heaven for you. Nero cannot take it from you. The Roman soldiers cannot rob it from you. Your boss cannot take it from you. It is reserved in heaven by God himself for you. Because of Jesus, we have a guaranteed inheritance. Let me show you a third thing. I love this one. Because of Jesus, you have an end date to your suffering. Because of Jesus, you have an end date to your suffering. And I know I, uh, on a weekly basis, we meet with people who are suffering. Yesterday, I drove to Boynton Beach and met with a godly man, a godly friend of mine, who this last week, man, just got bad diagnosis after bad diagnosis after bad diagnosis. And understandably so, he was, he was discouraged, he was depressed, and he was despondent. We can look to somebody like that and somebody like you and say, man, I know you're suffering now, but guess what? There is an end date to your suffering. Verse 6 says, though now for a little while. That phrase, a little while, is chronological. It's a phrase that designates a period of time. It implies that such a time will come to an end. Here's what I want you to catch. Here's what he's saying. Your suffering has an expiration date on it. It might seem like it's ongoing to you, but your suffering has an expiration date on it. Now, I get that not all deliverance will come in this life. I remember before I came, Dr. Bob Barnes was the interim pastor here, and one of our dear ladies was, was dying of cancer, and, and Bob brought her down front. Some of you might remember this and had a word of prayer with her, and Bob looked right at her, and he said, you will be healed either in this life are in the life to come. And God took that precious lady home and I was able to preach her funeral. But guess what? She's not suffering anymore. The expiration date to her suffering is over. Here's what I want you to catch. We need to confront our suffering with a long-term perspective. Let me illustrate, simple, stupid illustration. But let's say on January 1st of this year, January 1st of 2017, you had the worst day of your life. All right, on, on January 1st of this year, you wrecked your car and found out you had no insurance. Oh, on that same day, your, your boss chewed you out and came this close to firing you. On that same day, the air conditioner of your house went out and you were confronted with a huge bill to replace it. On that same day, your child was expelled from school and one of your parents passed away. From start to finish, hands down, worst day of your life. But then every other day this year was terrific. From, from, from January 2nd on, your relationship with God blossomed. You got a large you got a promotion with a large salary increase. God, God blessed your family with another child. Your tax refund was huge, and you were able to take a long vacation to Hawaii. <laughs> now, January 1st of next year, if someone looked at you and said, how was 2017 for you? How was that year for you? You would say, man, it was terrific. It was fantastic. You'd, you'd remember that one bad day, but get it, 365 good days are better than one really bad day. Does that make sense? Church, listen, there's coming a day when all of the bad days will be over. And from that point forward, they will only be good days. The hymn writer said it this way, there's coming a day when no heartaches shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye, all is peace forevermore. On that happy golden shore, what a day, glorious day that will be. Everybody suffers, but your suffering is temporary. 
I want you to see one third thing. The third thing is this. Your suffering has a purpose. Your suffering has a purpose. Peter actually mentions three things in the passage, and I'll I'll hit them quickly today. The first thing he says is this. Your suffering demonstrates the genuineness of your faith. The, The way that you go through suffering demonstrates the genuineness of your faith. In verse 7, he says this, so that the tested genuineness of your faith. Here's what I'm saying, and he says it in the passage, faith like gold is best verified in the midst of fire. Anybody can give you a ring or a bracelet or a necklace and say, oh, this is solid gold, but you got to prove it's solid gold, right? And, and gold is proven. I'm sure there's, there's other ways, but here in the passage, he says that gold is proven by fire. Here's what I want us to catch. Admittedly, it's much easier to pray. It's much easier to praise. It's much easier to persevere when life is good, is it not? Praise Jesus, I got money in the bank. Praise Jesus, all of us are healthy. Praise Jesus, we just bought a new car, whatever it is. It's easier to pray and praise God when everything that is going good. Let me ask you today, but can you still be faithful when the fire gets hotter? Can you still be faithful when the bank account gets smaller? (laughs) Can you still be faithful when the pain gets more intense And the pain gets stronger. You see, Peter says, man, suffering demonstrates the authenticity of your faith. So let me ask you a simple question. When you go through problems, do you run to Jesus or do you run away from Jesus? That's a great test for us. And I get it because because struggles make us doubt and struggles make us question, but 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 the fires, the testing fires, will prove whether our faith is real or whether our faith is not real. He says the second thing. He says your suffering will result to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is so deep. It's so rich. Catch it. God often allows us to go through struggles so that he will receive the honor and the glory. You know the story, John chapter 9? The disciples disciples found a man that was blind. And, And in their sincerity, they go to the Lord. They see this poor man that's blind. And so their question is this. Wow, Lord, who sinned? <laughs> was it him or, or was it his parents? I mean, whose fault is this that this guy's suffering so much? Je- Jesus' response is, is classic and it's, and it's wise and it's profound. Jesus answered and said, my translation, we'll put it up on the screen. Jesus answered and said, it's not because this man sinned or his parents sinned, but this happened for the glory of God. God allowed this man to go through suffering so that God, so that Jesus would be honored and glorified. Catch this, you've got to be mature to to, to hear this, all right? You've got to be mature. How cool would it be if God shows you, if God shows your suffering to magnify and manifest his power here in the world. If God looks down and he sees you or he sees her and he says, man, (laughs) I want to manifest my glory in their life. And so for that purpose, I'm going to send them through a temporary struggle. Your suffering may result to the praise and the glory of Jesus Christ. The last thing is this. Your suffering will strengthen your faith. Verse 8, though you do not see him, you love him and believe in him and rejoice with joy. So here's what he's saying. Like like us, most of these people had never personally seen Jesus Christ. He said, though you don't see him, you love him. 
And, and though he's not with you now, you believe in him. How is it that on the run, persecuted Christians who had never personally seen Jesus Christ believed in him? How is it? God used their suffering to strengthen their faith. As they went through those trials, they saw God at work on their behalf. They didn't focus on what was infecting them. They focused on who was indwelling them. Listen, get this. Suffering is not good. It's never good. I don't, I, I don't want you to walk away from here and you know, say, okay, God, bring it on. I'm ready to suffer. Suffering is never good. It's never enjoyable for that period of time. But God can use it to accomplish good in your life. Does that make sense, church? Does that make sense? Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, himself, he himself will restore, he will confirm, he will strengthen, and he will establish you. In other words, God wants to use it in your Here's what I want you to catch today. None of us are exempt from suffering. None of us. I'm not exempt from suffering. Most or some of you have met, you know our daughter, Amber. I could bring Amber in here today. If you don't know Amber, we have a 23-year-old daughter who has cerebral palsy. Amber has the mental capabilities of a three-month-old baby. She can't understand anything we say. She's never spoken, never carried on a conversation with us, never looked and said, Mommy, I love you. Daddy, I love you. 100% dependent. Amber's 23 years old. She's been in the hospital 21 times in 23 years. Amber's life consists of being at home. She gets agitated on a regular basis and yells out and even hits herself at times. And we have no idea what Amber's going through because she can't communicate to us. It's difficult for us to take Amber anywhere because we never know how Amber is going to respond. It's tough sometimes. I mentioned that for this reason, all right? Not so you can say, man, I sure feel sorry for Brian and Vicki. Listen, we're good. We are really good. Amber's a gift to us. We are so grateful for her. But I mention it so that you know that all of us suffer. And it doesn't matter what you're going through today. Here's what we want you to catch. You don't have to go through it alone. As a matter of fact, I love these words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26. I think I put it up on the screen. Notice what it says. If one member suffers, all of us suffer together. What we want to accomplish in this series is to realize that you don't have to suffer alone. First of all, it doesn't matter what you're going through today. You have hope in Jesus Christ. Your future is much more glorious than your present. But you don't have to suffer alone. We've given you a little card today. Can you pull that out for just a second? We've given you a little card that simply says this, united in suffering. You'll notice it's anonymous. We're not asking you to put your name on it. We don't want to know your name. But we'd love to know what you're struggling with. We'd love to be able to lock arms with you in your trials. We'd love to be able to pray for you in your pain. We'd love to be able to encourage you in your struggles and in your temptations. So here's what we're going to ask you to do. Stephen and the team's going to come in just a second. If you just contemplate what it is you're struggling with, whatever it is, 
write it on that card. And, and, and we'd invite you, if you want to come, to come and just spend a few moments at the altar and give that to the Lord. Maybe you want to reach over to somebody next to you and share your struggle with them and spend some time in prayer with them. You see, quite frankly, church, every single Sunday ought to, uh, ought to be a family reunion where we get together. And you, know, you ever sit through a family reunion and listen to your aunts and your uncles talking about all their health problems? I think we do that now, don't we, Vicky? That's what we do now. My brother was here while we were just talking about it. What are you struggling with? Man, I'm struggling with the same thing, you know? That's what family does, man. Family together, we love one another. We pray for one another. You might sit back and say, Brian, I'm good. I'm good. Hey, thank God for the fact you're good right now, but guess what? Guess what? There's going to be a day when you're not going to be good. There's going to be a day when you're going to get a phone call that you don't want. There's going to be a day that you're going to hear something from the doctor that you don't want to hear, and you're going to need a family who loves you. You're going to need a God who gives you strength. You're going to need a redeemer who has overcome sin and death in the grave. You're going to need Jesus Christ. Run to him. Run to him. He is our living hope. Would you stand with me today? We're going to end the service worshiping today. Stephen and the team are going to lead us in worship. Man, if you just want to come and, and bring your sheet, fold it over. Nobody needs to know what it is. Place it on the altar. Give it to God. Spend a few moments in prayer. Man, we would love that. We would love that. If you just want to spend some time in prayer with somebody there, we would love that as well. Let's be united today in our suffering. And I would say this, if you're here today and you desperately need Jesus Christ, would you allow us to pray with you? Would you allow one of our leaders to, to, to spend time with you in prayer and point you to Jesus Christ? Let's worship together.